بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم uh, welcome uh, all colleagues uh, and guests in uh, the second lecture of the Caesar uh, step by step and, and the title of today's lecture is document properly so we are talking about the documentation uh, before I uh, talk about the documentation I say here that I hear you like I put the first evaluation or the evaluation of the first lecture I got 22 responses. Let's go quickly through these ones. Uh, how you evaluate the content and audiovisual, you are satisfied enough. That's very good. Uh, a course will help to change my career or help a lot in my career planning. Uh, it came between uh, totally agree and agree to some extent, which is good. So we are talking to the right people. And uh, thanks for your evaluation for myself as uh, four to five uh, in the evaluation. Uh, let's go to the important section of this uh, document now, which is um, for the coming lecture, I would like to know more about, and uh, I heard from you that there's various forms like workplace-based assessment and triangulation, that stuff, and that's coming actually today, and the evidence uh, breakdown uh, with triangular data, that's again coming today. And the second segment, which is is important as well is uh, the course will improve dramatically if uh, it was a speciality dedicated or concise. We're talking about anesthesia, but the administrative section is almost uh, the same in all because you are dealing with General Medical Council. Show examples of uh, completed uh, workplace based assessment. Again, this is a part of documentation which is happening today. Uh, I'm, I'm really sorry for who asked to make this uh, at night. I was planning to do, but I am engaged with uh, different courses in the uh, in Saving Lives Academy, so it's not possible to happen. So I'm really sorry for that. So uh, what I'm, I'm trying to say, please evaluate the lectures. I, I made a poll today, but you still can evaluate on the Telegram group. And again, the Telegram group link is uh, in the base uh, segment of these slides. I'm again uh, stressing and highlighting and emphasizing the importance of you go to the General Medical Council on the specialty specific guidance and click uh, on the guidance of your specialty. So like here, it, this is anesthetics. This is how we deal with all this uh, file. Once you press anesthetics, you will find the SSG. We had discussed that in the last uh, uh, lecture. We're not going again through this one. Uh, I had a lot of people asking me the process is not clear. Please clarify it more. You have to read, you have to do your homework. It's a long pathway, it's tiring pathway. You cannot get it from just one video lecture or you cannot get it all the data, all the, that knowledge from uh, just an hour watching any video. That's not possible, I'm afraid. So again, you have to do your homework, read, read, read. You have to read a lot to reach, we're trying to simplify it, but you still have to do your homework. And this is, again, the annexes that you have uh, to do as a homework. Uh, you can go thoroughly quick, thoroughly or quickly through these ones. It's up to yourself and up to your time. But again, it's a mandatory to know how the Medical Council is thinking about you, how they will assess and how the college will look at your paper. So you have to build this knowledge before you think about doing the Caesar. This is the roadmap we started uh, uh, couple of weeks ago and we finished one two three and four that segment is done so we're going going now to the second section which is document details uh, but i will add a little uh, more to these documents so uh, the objectives of today's lectures is the timeline of your application how much time it takes uh, to finish my application that's the first part. Different terminologies will go through uh, different terms because it's really essential to understand the difference between different terms, uh, what to document, how to document, and then we'll go through different uh, documents like you how to write your CV, pro forma, cut forms, workplace-based assessments. So all these uh, different documents are coming today. So uh, this is the timeline. Once you submit your application, you will receive an auto email reply or auto reply email says that we received your application and we are uh, studying or uh, we are examining your application and we'll let you know as soon as we can uh, and you don't give any time in this auto reply but within uh, a month time of submission you will get a letter uh, carries the first checklist of your evidence First checklist, you will find they rejected certain uh, uh, papers and they accepted certain papers and they will ask you why they rejected that and what you need to do. If you want to submit from the 
from the medical council to the GMC like that, it's fine, it's up to yourself, but you know your application mostly will fail because they, advise, they are advisors. So you need to follow the advisors what they ask for. So they will give you 60 days to modify that evidence. And we had discussed that in the last video. I strongly recommend that you uh, review the last video. This, there, was two, there were two sections. Uh, one of them is uh, what they ask it for. And the second one is to upload your document. So this is what you need to do in this these 60 days. So what I'm trying to say here, if your evidence is almost ready to go, uh, and like you're waiting for a month or 45 days, go and submit uh, initially. And still you can modify that within three months time, uh, one month you're waiting uh, their initial checklist and two months they will give you to modify the checklist. And, and maybe 99 to 100% there is a checklist. So the first checklist is not, uh, is never guaranteed to go from the first pass. So there's always a first checklist. There's always 60 days to submit your evidence or resubmit your evidence and requirements. So once you modify and submit your evidence, you will go to the final assessment, okay? It will take uh, up to three weeks for, for the final assessment and bring you the final checklist. And this is the one is submitted from the medical council to uh, the college, according to your college, like College of Anistis in our uh, scenario. So uh, they will send this to the verifier and they give the verifier 10 days. And this is very critical to liaise with your verifier to uh, say these documents are right. Otherwise, any document that's not verified is not going to be submitted and you will lose part of your evidence. And this will definitely affect your whole application. So who is the verifier? We'll know that in the coming slides. So but you need to liaise with your verifier and make sure that he answers within 10 days. So once he gets the email, he needs to say this document is correct. Uh, so the, then after this uh, final assessment, your uh, documents will go to the college, uh, Royal College, whichever college, and then it will take three months of the college and to reach your decision. Hopefully it is successful, but if it is not successful, you still have a uh, time uh, frame to re um, submit your papers or modify your evidence, uh, it will be uh, much easier at this stage. If it is a course or something, but if you need to repeat part of your training, they will give you a year time to resubmit your evidence. Otherwise your application is finished and then you need to submit a new application with the whole process from the start. So this is the time frame we spoke about, then terminology. What's the difference between uh, verifier and reference or referee? So some people call that reference or referee, it doesn't matter really, but verifier is the one person who signed your pro forma and he is one from each hospital. So if you work like, if you are submitting a five years, you can be working every six months in different hospitals. So you have 10 different hospitals. So you have to submit 10 different performance. If you work at the whole five years in just one hospital, so you need just one performance. So it's one from each hospital. And it can be the CEO of the hospital, any person uh, responsible for training, like the college tutor, like uh, the head of department, whoever is happy to review the papers you're submitting and says that these papers are absolutely correct. And he should have, he must have, a copy of all the documents you attach to this pro forma at his email, okay? And you don't very you don't add any more documents after you send home this email. So he is signing your pro forma. We'll go in the pro forma details again today, but again, he sh you shouldn't add any more documents unless he is happy to and signs another pro forma with this document contained in this one. Okay, but again, it is one verifier, one person from each hospital. Can be, can he be a non-medical person? Uh, no, uh, it's it's clearly stated. It's someone who was in the medical supervisory position and worked in the hospital where, where your training had happened or took place. Okay, uh, so he should confirm. That's very important. That all your documents are correct. Okay, any document he does not approve it or he says that I don't know about this document, they will immediately drop it from your from your file. So you're losing one document. So the reference, this is a medical doctor that was super supervising yourself, like a college tutor or a consultant, and you should have four to six 
So if you're working in 10 different hospitals, select four to six that you have a very good uh, relationship and, 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 and they are happy to write for you this extensive workload and documents in, um, in an answer to the medical council when they are asking about you. So it's, 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 it's a good amount of work. So please make sure that you're happy enough to do that. So they should be oriented that you are doing this if you are putting uh, their name in your application. They will not be surprised uh, and find a medical council uh, request. So it's it's a bit different overseas if you are not in the United Kingdom. So uh, make sure that you are happy to do that. So terminology, what is authentication and validation? They are completely two different procedures. So the first is authentication that happens by a solicitor or a lawyer. Uh, so he signs dates his, his uh, time of signature and put his stamp. That's an authentication. This is for the non-medical uh, uh, papers. Like, for example, if you took an award and you got a photo of this uh, award or uh, you got a prize and this is not a medical one, like you did a racing or uh, anything or swim race or something like that, and you submitted that as an evidence. Okay, that's very good, but you cannot ask for a medical uh, consultant to sign that form. So you go to the solicitor when he, he says that this document is correct and he signs dates and stamps. This is for authentication. This is the same as your qualifications. Qualifications should be authenticated, like your uh, bachelor degree or your master's degree. Okay, that's not supervised by your medical uh, supervisor. So this is for authentication, if you're not familiar with this word. Validation. This is like the pro forma employment letters, and it could be validated by uh, your medical supervisor, like the consultant in the case, or, or, or CEO or head of department in case of the pro forma, or from the HR uh, if you are submitting an employment letter or a letter to uh, whom it may concern or something like that about your working time in the hospital. So this should be verified by uh, the hospital HR, not uh, not by the medical persons. So it depends if you're validating your paper, who is uh, your supervisor could be a medical person or a non-medical person. It depends on the document, but authentication is always, always non-medical person. It's a solicitor. Okay, so here, when you're submitting your evidence, as you see here, all copies must be authenticated or validated. So it's either or, it cannot, like, it's, it's either for a solicitor or for a head of department, if it's medical or non-medical paper, and anonymized. So make sure that you anonymize all your evidence if you're mentioning your uh, name of your colleague or a name of a patient or anything like that. That's extremely important in the medical council. Okay, what and how to document? We are talking about, first of all, the CV, and we'll talk about that in details, but it should triangulate all the time. They are strongly recommending that this is nothing confidential. Triangulation, they are uh, comparing documents to each other. So for example, if you document your CV, you write, I work in this hospital from this time to that time in this hospital. You have to uh, support your claim in your CV by the contract and work permit in the same days. So you cannot mistake that one. So please make sure that your CV absolutely correlate with your contract and work permits. Rotas and job plans, you cannot claim in your in your logbook something and you find in your rotas that you are not rostered in this day. Otherwise you need to make a justification. You may come, you may have come uh, in, in emergency position or something like that, an emergency situation and you cover this list. You have to prove that by a letter from the head of department, for example, but you cannot do mistakes in this it's very important and very sensitive your training documents will go through them uh, we have two uh, retas and arcps this is two common terms uh, used in your ssg form what's the difference uh, retas is record of in training assessment so like the dops kicks and mats and annual review arcp which is annual review of competence progression or simply the appraisal uh, they are both taking the same uh, box and the proof forms. We'll go now to the documents, but from the most important to uh, the less important, or all of them are actually important, but like the highest importance is your CV. What to do in your CV? Number one, your name and your CV must match your proof of identity if you're submitting your passport. So it should be the same name on the passport. 
uh, four domains oriented. So read the main domains and write the CV in the same orientation of the four domains. I strongly recommend don't submit your work CV. If you're doing interviews for to get, to get a job and you're using your CV, you have to write a new CV for the Caesar purpose. Don't use your regular CV. Please make a new one because you are talking differently about yourself. It's not to get this job. So you are not job oriented CV. No, it is Caesar oriented CV. Okay, for domains, you can you can use later on for the jobs your Caesar uh, CV, but not the opposite. You are again highlighting your work. I've been working for this hospital from this time to that time in such hospital, and you make sure that your contract and workplace and, and work permit is saying the same with the same um, start and finish dates. Uh, you should number your CV in each page, so each page is 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 uh, numbered, and show your surname and initials on the top of each page, and they are like. In, in the past, when we have been submitting uh, the, uh, the evidence by uh, hard copies, it was very important not to miss any page of the papers, but now we are submitting everything in PDF. They are still still asking for that one, but I think they are a little bit more lax at this point. Use bullet points, so don't write like long uh, comprehensions uh, in, 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 in the term of long wording uh, format. No try to highlight, make it easier. And this is uh, like the cover uh, page of my CV. So this is uh, the index in page one, the like personal details, current employment, uh, career plans. So make it easier for them. If I want to read one segment, like the courses, I will go to like page six to seven. And this is section E and like management and leadership skills. Make it easier, make, make their, their job easier. So they will like your application otherwise, like, if you give them hard time, I think they will pay you back and give you a bit hard time. Like the pro forma, we spoke about the pro forma in the first uh, video, but again, we are highlighting the same. So the pro forma is a form signed by uh, your consultant, okay, or uh, the one in, in your so on your supervision uh, from different hospitals. So it's one for each hospital. And here, this is the appraisals and assessment, like uh, workplace based assessment form. This is a PDF file in this date, and its number of pages is two pages, okay. So you submit your DOPS, uh, LMATS, uh, mini kicks, whatever you submit. Here, the logbooks, uh, logbook statistics, so all, and the forms, like, for example, if you submit your logbook as an Excel sheet, this will not be a PDF, it will be an Excel sheet. If you submit a photo, it could be a JPG. Uh, so whatever here in this document should be, again, packed in a zipped file and sent to your uh, uh, consultant who or the verifier that documented uh, this pro forma for you. So if they go back to him, is this document, like the job description, correct? In the in this date and with this number of pages, he will go back to this email from yourself and review and says, yes, it is correct. So he has to have a copy of this pro forma and a copy of all the documents that you used. That's very, very important. Okay, let's go to the completion of unit of training form or the competence assessment form. It should be it should be dated from this date to that date. So like you had been working this module of training from this time to this time. There is certificate of training, which counts how many modules you did over how many months. So like this is intensive care for three months. Uh, this is anesthesia for GI and colorectal for one month. This is certificate of training. Completion of unit of training mean, literally says what are the competencies and this is derived from uh, you have to go and read the annexes again see what are the competencies they are asking for and then modify it again modify it as per what you did don't claim anything you didn't do because it will be very obvious there so you, you're, you're faking or making a fraud or something like that so do I'm, I'm stressing and emphasizing this point you have to do and write what you actually did Okay, be honest with yourself and, and with uh, uh, medical counseling college. So this is what I did in these competencies. Okay, and then they will uh, again put the date and uh, like this is the date from this period to this period and, and sign it and stamp it from the hospital I've been working for. So the competencies form or completion of unit of training, 
what is the unit, name of the unit, name of the hospital, and the competencies from knowledge and clinical skills, okay? What they are happy that you had done during this period of training of two months or six months or what's this. Workplace-based assessment is a simple form. You would put uh, uh, the college, your college uh, logos and hospital logos and put the hospital name and the time uh, and your definitely college ID and your name. And then they are saying, if they assess you during this one and give you this satisfactory or non-satisfactory, it depends on what. So this is the personal observation, the formal assessment, the trainee uh, logbook and portfolio and department uh, patient uh, records, okay? So departmental patient records. So this is what, how they said you are satisfactory or not satisfactory. Okay, if there is a comment here, make sure that this comment is taken care of in the next assessment. So if you need more training in this stuff, next module when you're assessed or next rotation when you're assessed, you cover this one, okay? So this is another form of work workplace-based assessment, which is a bit more comprehensive. It depends on the hospital you're working in, what they use, okay? So here, this is like this assessment satisfactory, satisfactory. this is a knowledge base, this is a clinical judgment, this is, uh, this is how they assess you and everything. And here, this is the last comment. Okay, so in this comment, they asked me to do more uh, third on core or senior reg uh, uh, rotas. Then I took care of that one in the next rotation and I did that. So annual review of, comp uh, of competence progression or ARCP. Uh, I do that because I'm not working in the United Kingdom. I do that uh, via a private company. Uh, I'm not saying the name of the company here, definitely. I'm not advertising any companies because I have no conflicts of interest. Uh, so this company is doing uh, that uh, job for you. So what they do, they will give you a software or uh, a website or whatever they do. Uh, they, you upload all your evidence. So you upload your uh, CBD points, you upload your uh, personal development plans, you upload all the documents, then they will refer that to an assessor. Okay. And this assessor will evaluate your evidence and then will go uh, via an official meeting with you to make your appraisal, okay? So he will say, okay, this is good, this is bad, you have to modify this, you have to work on that part. Uh, my advice to you is like that, this and that, okay? So you still can uh, do this one with your consultant, but I find like these consultants uh, in these private companies are uh, getting training for this one. So they are trained to do this job. So if your consultant is happy, you can give him, this is what you need to do in my appraisal and he can follow you in this one and give you that certificate of uh, satisfactory appraisal. So again, the date of appraisal is most important. Try to do everything uh, uh, on time. So don't do uh, retrospective. Uh, it will be much harder to prove that and it will, it will be accepted if you do that uh, retrograde, but it carries less uh, weight compared to if you do everything fresh on time. Uh, so this is, again, the end result of this appraisal is the certificate of appraisal. After five years, as per the General Medical Council regulations, you know you need to go for a revalidation. So appraisal is the annual or yearly uh, evaluation. Five years, after five years, they will collect all these five years appraisals and give you a license renew. Okay, so they renew your, your license after revalidation, depending on the annual appraisal or annual assessment of what you did. This is how they want you to present again to the medical council and again to your specialty registration. So structured reference form. So it's a reference form from again, who is a college tutor or your supervisor. And he will say, uh, this is your knowledge and clinical skills and professional attitude and development personal skills and attributes. So it's a full form of six pages. Again, you need to do uh, this one as a supportive evidence. Logbooks, uh, logbooks are uh, important that you contain uh, the date of the procedure, uh, the patient uh, operation, um, the speciality. It's better to submit your logbooks in the term of speciality or subspeciality. So anesthesia for neurosurgery, anesthesia for cardiovascular surgery. Uh, very, very important to uh, mention the supervision code, uh, distance supervision, local supervision, or uh, direct supervision. So uh, direct means he, the consultant at time of induction uh, was inside theater supervising yourself. Uh, and and um, local, he was in the hospital, but 
uh, he's not supervising you directly and remote or distant again he is not he's like an on call from home he is over the phone with yourself you cannot submit anything uh, without supervision code because you should be supervised at different uh, levels so you're not working as a consultant so everything should have its supervision code and this is a part of assessment anesthesia so this is anesthesia details was it a general anesthesia intracranial intubation arterial line central line something like that if you put that yourself asa scoring and plus uh, starting time end time that should be there but i didn't include those ones in this logbook i hope it is accepted like that so this is the main uh, elements and if there is any local anesthesia any procedures you should mention that as well so this is uh, how we submit our logbooks so as you see here this is 2016 so it's still included in the five years so they may uh, reject that if it's older than five years or you still can submit it as supportive evidence uh, of your training but it carries a lot weaker uh, evidence than the five years so i don't recommend that you submit anything in the last five after the five years or actually behind the five years okay so this was the logbook this is the form of the logbook so you're mentioning these details but this is a logbook summary or logbook report so it will give you some statistics and this is from uh, the college of the east of ireland uh, when we do this statistics so this is a patient sex male or female this is the age group this is how many patients of each and the percentage is a scoring time of the day is it during the working hours or uh, the on call time and this is the percentage and this is how many uh, total procedures this is 300 uh, patients in this year and this is the degree of supervision again percentages uh, case uh, scheduling uh, it's charged to where and um, the, any critical incidents and this is the number of critical incidents happened okay uh, general anesthesia versus local anesthesia procedures this is the summary of this logbook so the, it, it's much easier for them to look at the summary but again you need to support your main logbook uh, with this one that's why it's important to use either your website from the medical council or from uh, uh, the hospital or you can send all your logbooks to uh, a statistician to do this logbook summary and report for yourself it's it's a bit tiring if you do that uh, by the medical statistics but it's, it's ready made if you are using any software it will come uh, straight away um, uh, to that conclusion it, it's it's very easy to use uh, via softwares or websites uh, like in in ireland we do that via the college of anesthesia of ireland we have an access to that one uh, this is another uh, term or form of uh, logbook summary so it's different form so it doesn't matter which logbook summary or report you use, but it's again delivering the same idea. So how many patients you did in this uh, year? Uh, what was the general, local, uh, region anesthesia? So something like that. Okay, so uh, the idea of triangulation between different documents, like if you say in my roster or in my rota, uh, this day I was doing a course, so I was here in an annual leave or not, my name is not mentioned in this one, uh, in your rota, while you submitted cases in your logbook saying that I was doing this, uh, it's a fraud, it's definitely a fraud, or you need to justify how you'd been doing this course, and in the same time, time you documented cases that you had done. That's why it's very important and very essential uh, that you don't document retrograde otherwise like it will be uh, false or incorrect or fraud something like that so they do triangulation and they said that they are tri triangulating or uh, correlating all the documents together so like for this day i put uh, i was in the cardiothoracic surgery list and uh, cardiothoracic anesthesia and then i put an epidural in my adopts it doesn't make any sense why you put an epidural uh, for a patient who is receiving like cardiothoracic surgery if it's not uh, in your hospital for example <clears throat> or anything like that sorry so if you are given a spinal for example or codal for a patient who is receiving cardiothoracic and so like they correlate the dops uh, kicks almats and all that stuff with your rota and with your logbook so they do this triangulation uh, uh, during the process so that's very important what's the dops now so uh, direct observation of a procedure skill so uh, again this document is from the medical council of uk so it's available in uh, in the G gmc website and again it's in your documents that i submitted in the telegram uh, group uh, so here uh, 
this is one of the bops like for an arterial line or pediatric arterial line insertion. This is a procedure of thoracic epidural. This is a central line and double lumen tube. And this is uh, what went well, what could uh, have gone uh, better. So if there is any comment here, you need to take care of that and repeat this procedure and prove that you did this part better according to this recommendation. And this is planned for the next uh, uh, development or uh, for what you need to do. So continue the same here, uh, uh, review uh, optimal thoracic levels for liver uh, surgeries. So if there is a comment, you need to consider what's happening after this in your next DOPS. So again, a few more DOPS. This is bronchoscopy. This is modified rapid sequence induction. So you have to make a mix if you're submitting your DOPS. Okay, some people don't submit DOPS at all and uh, cut form is using that as only evidence. So again, if you're doing the DOPS, make it properly. Uh, so here, this is a distance supervision. And uh, that was case transfer from, uh, like was a pediatric case trans transfer. That's why I included this one. So it was a distance supervision over the phone. I transferred this uh, kid from a county to another county, from hospital to another hospital. So it's something to be mentioned in your um, in your documentation. So uh, it depends on your level of training. If you are submitting for uh, uh, basic or intermediate or high or advanced. So all this evidence I, I, I am putting here as an advanced uh, uh, level of training. But again, sometimes I put like intracale intubation and airway management. So, so just something to tick the box and document that I do that properly. So they need to see uh, evidence for um, basics as well as the advanced ones. Okay, so um, uh, midlines, uh, central lines are something they are expecting you to uh, present in your DOPS. Again, what are the DOPS you should use? You have to go back to the annex, how many DOPS, many kicks, mats uh, you need to submit for each module if you are following this one. Okay, again, case-based discussion. So uh, if you did, for example, this is a pediatric uh, general surgery list, including these uh, three patients with blah, 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 blah. Okay, and we had a discussion during this case about uh, certain, uh, like the neurodevelopment in, uh, in pediatrics. We had this discussion, okay, you present uh, this to your consultant, okay, and what is uh, the feedback? So what went well, what needs to improve? or what could improve. And this, again, the documents are available. So you need the hospital uh, logo and uh, the details, your details, your supervisor details, and the date. Again, this is 2018, so it's back in time. So it proves that I was doing that on time, not a retrospective evidence. Here, this is a case-based discussion on uh, the relief article, and we discussed the statistical knowledge. So again, try to make it variable depending on your annex. You may put that in more details or less details, it's up to yourself. But again, it is something you need to mention about the case-based discussion. Again, this is a robotic right hemocolectomy. This is a procedure that's not uh, commonly used in uh, in the general hospital. So I would I wanted to document that I had this discussion uh, about the robotic surgery and what's anesthetic plans and precautions. And again, he said it's like no comments in, in, in this comment section. So the, it's satisfactory evidence that I can do that in the proper way. Again, the HIPIC procedure. So again, this is one of the procedures that we do in, in, in the hospital I'm working for uh, in the moment. So again, CBD case-based discussion is uh, anesthesia list management. It could be anesthesia list or uh, ward uh, list or a pain list or pre-op assessment clinic. You see multiple patients and you had a discussion with all the patients you supervised or you managed it and what went well again what needs to improve it's the same setup but again you need to prove that okay so <coughs> uh, the anesthesia list management and uh, akex is again almost similar documents uh, i didn't submit a lot of akex so i i'm not in a position to advise you in this one but we can get more details from dr muhammad Urgham at the end because i'm not familiar i'm not I, I said in the beginning of this lecture series, I'm saying what I know, I don't, what I don't know, I'm confident enough, happy enough to say I don't know that one. So I would recommend also, if you have enough time, to go to the SSG for different, uh, for different specialties, because the SSG is, is, is done in a very nice way. 
uh, in uh, some specialties better than the others. So like unsuccessful applications, this is pediatrics, okay? This is medical pediatrics, not pediatric anesthesia. They said the unsuccessful applications or poor evidence is usually coming in, uh, in these areas, like if you are doing uh, no evidence on APLS, pediatric advanced life support, uh, or neonatal resuscitation, uh, evidence of child protection, Applicants provide proof of pro evidence of clinical governance, like audits, and they are stressing on these audits. Applic like this section in the, this pediatric is not in our anesthesia SSG. So it's not written why applications fail. But I believe applications fail on two sections, the medical council one and uh, uh, the college one. Medical council, usually 99.99%, they submit whatever you get, you, you give to them, to the college. So they don't, they don't fail your application unless like there's no performance, they cannot accept this one. So you had done the administrative part definitely before they submit to the college. So failure, pass or fail will come from the college. So this is a uh, common uh, reasons for failing your document in the college. So uh, that's nice to read if you have time, uh, different uh, SSGs from different specialities and just read what you need to do like this uh, special. This is a report for one of our colleagues that he applied for Caesar in uh, 2015, that's five years back. Uh, so he got his application is unsuccessful. And he said like your satisfactory uh, clinical knowledge with the European diploma in anesthesia and intensive care. And uh, that's very important because there were there were hearsays before about this European diploma is not accepted and you have to do the FRCA, which is not correct. That was proven now that European diploma is enough as a knowledge uh, proof uh, to be uh, on the specialist register, but they failed him in pediatric anesthesia and uh, in uh, evidence in intermediate pain. So this is the recommendation towards the end. So you will get at the end of your procedure uh, 17 or 18 pages. Uh, this 17 or 18 pages uh, ends up in the last page that this recommendation for your application, you need to do this and that. So they recommend for him to do the higher pediatric and at some modular training, it will take a while. Uh, you may do that in, in three weeks or three months. It's up to yourself. Do you need a proof? And then they will give you a year to submit uh, this evidence. So here, uh, my take home message, uh, honesty and integrity are mandatory. Assessment uh, for collective evidence is not the, the number of documents. So it's not important. I, I submitted 100 DOPS and 100 CBDs. Uh, it's important that you take all the boxes. So it's the variety uh, of your evidence. The completion of unit of training is the most important document in that regards, in the clinical training that you have done this and this. And your consultant is happy to support you that you have done this uh, modular training and is happy to sign you off for this module of training. Uh, so again, uh, I cannot emphasize that enough. Read um, the speciality uh, specific guidance and the annexes very carefully. Uh, it's not again the importance of how many dops and kicks it is the content of these ones if you are satisfied and you're confident enough to submit that evidence or not uh, the exit exam takes the knowledge part uh, uh, so you have to focus on the clinical skills and the domains so completion of unit of training appraisal and that stuff is more important uh, my last advice is you can you can work hard or work smart but the one i prefer is work smartly hard uh, and I wish you best of luck with your application uh, here. Uh, thanks for, for watching. And uh, that's my part today. Uh, I will try to see if I can answer these questions quickly before we take, uh, uh, or we'll, we'll give these uh, questions again to make it uh, rich in the discussion uh, with, to Dr. Mohamed Durgham. So let me welcome uh, our first guest in this uh, Caesar series, uh, Dr. Mohamed Durgham. Uh, he has the uh, MD, F, uh, IPP, and FFP, MRCA. So he is pain interested or interested in the pain management, not in the pain. Uh, and he's a lecturer of anesthesia in Shams University. Uh, thanks uh, to himself that he agreed to be with us today. He even put his name as consultant pain. Uh, uh, management and anesthesia, not anesthesia and pain management. So his preference is is the pain. But despite that fact, he actually submitted his Caesar as CCT Caesar in anesthetics. And we know now what is the difference between CCT and non-CCT. Uh, CCT is something that is 
uh, that has a national training scheme in the United Kingdom. Non-CCT is something like the pain and cardiothoracic anesthesia, which is uh, there is no national training program. So you can, you, the college cannot compare you to a standard of training that they have because you don't have. So this is what they call non-CCT. There is no national training program for that. And is currently, uh, Dr. Mohamed Rahm is currently working in the university hospitals uh, Birmingham in UK, and he is reachable at mdurgham79 at gmail.com. A bunch of flowers, Dr. Durgham, for being with us today. Um, I've just I've just written it down this morning. I didn't have enough time, so it doesn't look fancy, right? Thanks so it's effort. just very simple. Yeah, go ahead. But I think um, it, rather than just speaking, right, um, putting it on a piece of paper would, would make it much more easier. Um, if you are an overseas or if you are a UK, the process is the same, but it's about the difference or on how you get your evidence, right? So I, I will try to cover both, right? But it, it will be more towards anesthetics and more towards the UK um, doctors, right? So the, the, the Caesar simply is very doable. I want to reassure you, it is much more easier compared to how it was a few years back right? Um, in the early days, you would have to sign and stamp every single paper you are submitting. And this is virtually impossible, to be honest. It's very, very difficult, right? And most of the consultants wouldn't do it in the right way. So we have to sit next to them while, while they are doing it. And I've been through this process in the very early beginning of my process. But thankfully, in November 2017, I believe, everything has changed. Submitting it um, as soft copies and having the verification form has made it much, much more easier, right? So it is very doable. You, you just need to have a good mindset and you need to know what you actually need to do, right? First of all, you have to ask yourself, what is the Caesar structure? Caesar simply is equivalent of your overseas training to the UK training. It has three pillars time, Caesar modules, and exit exam. If you have a structured training for seven years overseas, and you have um, a, um, an approved test of knowledge as an exit exam, or you are willing to take or to sit the FRCA, then you, can, you, you, are, you are a candidate for Caesar, right? If your training overseas is less than seven years, so I think you have to think about it, or you may have to go through the national training. This is very important because to make a Caesar, you shouldn't need more than 18 months or maximum 24 months. If you have a good start and you are organized and you know what you need to do. So you can ask me how, how I can fulfill national training in 18 months. The, the answer is simply because you have ticked the box of time by your overseas training. So even if your overseas training is more than five years, it is still very important to tick the time box. For example, I've been graduating in 2003. How can I just submit evidence from 2014 or 15 without submitting any evidence for the 10 years uh, before this date? It also gives the assessor a very good um, reflection on who you are, who you came from, what sort of structured training you had. Because this is simply the definition of Caesar. You are, you are um, equalizing the overseas training with the national training. So where is your overseas training? Having said that, that doesn't mean you have to submit loads of evidence from overseas. Because the, the council and the Royal College know quite well that it is difficult to get retrograde um, documents um, from where, you're tra from where you, you were trained. They know that and they appreciate that and they accept they act, they do accept retrograde evidence. So you have to structure you have to write down your own evidence. And I agree with Dr. Walid. The best way is to be honest and transparent. And that automatically will tick the um, box of triangulation. You, you, you wouldn't have any problems with triangulation if you are honest and uh, transparent. Right. And you should be able to, to justify or to answer anything 
uh, that they don't understand in your in your evidence. Okay, so just to to, to make it short, I don't want to to uh, to, to to say to tell long uh, introduction. Uh, if you go below the time, just write down information about your hospital. How big is your hospital? The the the, the capacity of your hospital. The 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 um, the number of beds. The, the number of, 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 of surgical theaters, any information you can get from your hospital would be very beneficial. Certificate of experience, which I'm sure everyone can get that, right? Um, if you can get a structured training report, for example, if you spend seven years in a university hospital, it's very easy to get or to just write it down that I've been trained in the anesthetic department in whatever hospital. I have been through regular rotations, um, including general surgery, neuroanesthesia, cardiothoracic anesthesia, and so on, on three to six months rotation, right? And if, if, you, have, if you have assessments or if you've been assess, assessed on a regular basis, you should get some sort of evidence in this area. So by that, you are... Um, telling them that you have a good structured training overseas for a good amount of time, you've been assessed on a regular basis and so on. And that should be enough. That shouldn't um, make more than maybe 20 papers or, 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 some, or something around this figure. But again, this is, I, I believe this is very important. Some of the candidates may not agree with me, but I, I still believe this is very important because it does make sense. Uh, for the Caesar modules, it's not always clinical, but having said that, the clinical evidence is the biggest part of your evidence. It's 70 or 80 percent of your evidence, but there's still not clinical yeah. evidence that you will have to uh, make sure you are fulfilling. Most of the candidates, their applications wouldn't be acceptable from the first go due to one of the non-clinical um, uh, boxes, tick boxes. The clinical there are Royal College curriculum, I appreciate that. There, there is specialty training modules. However, for those who are working in anesthetics, there is a very important piece of information that you might not be aware of. Because if you just read the Royal College curriculum, you will get overwhelmed by the amount of knowledge and skills you need to fulfill. So if you are working in UK, just go through the regional um, school of anesthesia in your region. For example, there is um, um, Birmingham School of Anesthesia, there is Coventry School of Anesthesia, there is East Midlands School of Anesthesia. Ask one of the trainees which school of anesthesia he, he is following. Go through the website. It will be much more simple. It will just tell you how many assessments you need in a certain module and in which knowledge or skills. For example, it, it, can, it can ask you for a higher cardiothoracic anesthesia to submit four uh, workplace-based assessments, including one AKIX, one DOPS, one CBD, maybe one ALMAT. And under each of these um, workplace-based assessments, it will tell you exactly, or it will give you two or three options, which skill you need to present as DOPS, which um, topic you need to discuss as a CBD, and so on. On. So it will make it it will make your life much more easier than just going through the Royal College curriculum. Um, so you collect this evidence. And if you're working, sorry, if, you can, if you're working overseas, yeah. you can pick one of any yeah. one of the schools and just follow from the start. Is that correct? I, I I think so. I don't have a clear answer to that. However, if you go through two or three of these regional schools, for example, Birmingham School of Anesthesia, go to the higher level of training and um, open the Coventry, compare both, uh, pick whatever in common between them, right? Or just follow any of these. I don't, yeah. I don't think they're, they're, they should be equal in, in the yeah. way they assess. They, um, I think, no, I'm not, I'm not thinking, I'm sure they, the, the, the Royal College curriculum is just to guide them how to write these um, requirements for signing off the modules of training. Right, and there should um, be no major changes between uh, different schools. It, sh it, it shouldn't be, no be because it, it, it all, because all of the all of the uh, the schools of anesthesia get the the amount of evidence they need to sign off a module from the the, the curriculum. So yes, they are sure. all coming from the same source. So there shouldn't be any discrepancies. Yes. Yes. Um, at the end, cut forms are not mandatory, right? So you you are not required to submit cut forms. However. 
if you can get it, please do it, right? Yeah. Because if you have a cut form, the Royal College cannot negotiate this, right? So if you if you submit your evidence without the cut form, they may it, it will be up to the assessor, honestly. He may say, yes, I'm satisfied with this evidence. He may say, not, I don't feel this is up to a higher level evidence and you, you need to submit more evidence or to have more refresher sessions. But if you speak to your module lead in your local hospital and you have a cut form, they can't negotiate that. So simply, I promise, if you submit 14 cut forms in anesthetics, and it's not any 14 forms. I'll go through this maybe later. There are mandatory forms, there are four big modules, and there are optional modules. So if you submit the required for, for the required 14 cut forms, along with the non-clinical evidence, along with a bit of evidence from overseas training, I can promise you will get it from the first go. Okay. The non-clinical includes teaching. You should... Um, pick up every opportunity in your hospital for teaching, right? You should be proactive. If, 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 if you've been offered a teaching opportunity, please don't refuse it, okay? And organize and train yourself to your presentation very well. And more importantly, design your own feedback forms. You can have one from the, I think any Royal College has got a, a teaching feedback form. Um, spread these feedback forms to the audience before you start and collect it at the end, right? Don't rely much on emails because most of them will not come back to you. But if it is a written paper, they will just fill it and give it to you at the end of the lecture. And that will be much, much more easier. Then you can scan it and then you upload it on your application. Research and audit, right? I just want to reassure you that you don't have to invent a new procedure or invent a new drug. The audit can simply be on an airway trolley or a, a drug cupboard. It can be as simple as that. You don't have to do a big project, right? If, if you are involved in a big research, that's fine. But what I'm trying to say that it doesn't entail a big project or an invention. Right, A very simple audit and a re-audit to close an audit loop would be more than enough. You are expected, I think, to submit two audits. If one of these audits is a second audit for an audit loop, that's perfectly fine. You don't have to do the whole audit loop, okay? Uh, pick up any opportunity if there is any publication or a search going on uh, going in your, in your hospital, please pick it up. With regards to the management activity, again, it doesn't have to be a big thing. Just being a, co a rota coordinator is a management activity. It can be as simple as that. Okay, you, you don't have to be a management, or a manager, or or a lead of something to ha to have a management activity. Just if you are a, an advanced fellow, or if you are if if you if you organize the rota for the other fellows, that is a management activity. Okay, and how how you can get an evidence from that? If you can have just a simple letter two lines from your clinical lead that this person has been um, a ROTA coordinator for the trainees and fellows for this period of time, and this is considered as a management activity, that is more than enough. Clinical governance and quality improvement, there is a bit of overlap between both. An audit is a quality improvement project. So again, you don't have to, um, it is not a rocket science, right? Uh, an audit can be considered as a quality improvement. If you, if you want to go higher than that, if you uh, participated in designing um, uh, gui local guidelines for the hospital, and again, local guidelines doesn't mean a big thing. I mean, if you reorganize the drugs in the drug cupboard, that is a quality improvement project. If you um, reviewed the difficult airway trolley, that is a quality improvement project. Even if you... Um, pick up something that is not right in your hospital or could have been better. If you do that, that is a quality improvement project. And please keep your um, the dates of the clinical governance, uh, which either you attended or you presented in. And you can get a record of uh, attendance of the clinical governance meetings from the secretary. Because some, some, uh, some hospitals issue certificates for each 
clinical governance you've attended or you have presented in. And that will be an evidence that you have participated in the clinical governance and subsequently you have participated in a, an a, in, in a quality improvement in a quality improvement activity. Good. I hope it is simple. It's not very much complicated. CPDs, that in, includes all the courses that you have um, uh, attended uh, or participated. If you are participating as an instructor, that is a teaching activity. Or even if, if, even if you sit an exam, that is a CPD. If you read an article, that, that's a CPD, right? So this is a, like a summary of the structure, right? Because I feel that after any meeting, you will you will still ask yourself when wh where I should start. You should start with your overseas um, evidence and start straight away with your clinical evidence, right? Non-clinical evidence should go in parallel with um, both of them. You, your overseas training, if you are in UK, you should do that while you are at home, designing your own paperwork, your um, road rotation report. You gather the information about your uh, home hospital. And again, the exit exam, there is a list of approved tests of knowledge on the Royal College of Anesth Anesthesia. If you have one of them, that is perfectly fine. You don't have to sit the FRCA. If you don't have one of them, then you have to sit the FRCA. Um, these are few tips, right? That it's just from my, my own experience, right? And that will help you a lot. This is not written anywhere. It's not in the specialty specific guidance, but just like a clinical pearls or tips. Number one, tell everyone in your department about what you're doing, that you are doing a Caesar, which is simply an equivalence to the national training. Let everybody aware of your plans and objectives. This will, will help you much. Speak to the module leads. For example, if you decide to start with a general uh, module or regional module or cardiothoracics or neuro or whatever anesthetic module or whatever module in, in any specialty, the first is to, to go to the module lead and not just to speak to him in a corridor, just ask for a meeting, okay? Pre uh, tell, tell him in, his, in the email, what is the meeting about? Present your current evidence in a good way. For example, if you've worked in, in, in different hospital and you had a, a logbook for um, cardiothoracics, you had a logbook for ITU, you had few assessments, you had few teaching activity and or other non-clinical activity, present this current evidence to him. Ask him what additional evidence he would require to sign off the module. That will save you a lot of time because you don't, this is will bring us to number three. You do not necessarily need to spend three months in every module to sign off. You can sign off quite a lot of modules in, in one week or two, right? Remember that time box is already ticked by your overseas training. If you have a structured seven years overseas training, you don't have to worry about time. They will not look on, they will not look on uh, how long you spend in, in each and every module. So if you are going to a rotational fellowship, as I said, it's not, you don't necessarily need to spend three months in each and every module. Just ask him what additional evidence, if he say, um, he will probably not sign it straight, straight away if you are new to the hospital. He will, he will at least ask for some local sessions just to see you and to get some consultant feedback about you. He may ask about some more evidence, some um, more complex case, case mix, for example, if you're signing an ENT module and you have a big um, logbook, but it, all in, uh, it only includes um, tonsillectomies and um, uh, grommets tube and adenoidectomies, they will certainly um, ask for more complex case mix, like laryngectomies, like um, um, cancer operations and so on, right? So he, he will ask for something but once you, once you fulfill the, those uh, requirements, he will sign it off straight away. He will sign the cut form straight away. And that can save you a lot of time. Number four, be very well organized because by the end of two or three years working, you will have a lot of information, a lot of documents. Create your own folder, folders and subfolders on your computer. For example, a folder with workplace-based assessments, folder for logbook, appraisals, feedback, multi-source feedback, and teaching feedbacks and consultant feedbacks. Try to do feedbacks at least once a year, okay? 
and name your files properly because it does make huge difference when you come to the stage of uploading your evidence to the GMC website. So please, for example, you are, this file is an AKEX because for example, in, in, in anesthetics, you have to have um, an account on the LLP platform, which is a lifelong platform. It's newly designed, I think one year or two. Before that, there was only ePortfolio, which is only open for trainees. But now it's much more easier. The LLP is available for everyone. You just contact the Royal College, they will give you an access. And then you, have to, you don't have to worry about sending paperwork to the consultants. You just send it online and he will approve it online. And then when you open your account, once it's approved, you can download a PDF copy. It is as simple as that. So when you download it, put it in, in the relevant folder and name it properly. For example, AKEX underscore CTS, which is cardiothoracic surgery, underscore UHP, which is University Hospital of Birmingham, right? Um, be self-motivated. This is all about Caesar. Accept some delays due to service provision duties. So if you're starting a job, don't rush to signing the paperwork. Don't say, I've been here for three months. I haven't signed any uh, modules. It, it, it's still so early. You need at least three to six months to get people to know you well before you start asking for signing off. So take it easy at the beginning. And once you start, I'm sure you will get there. Um, as I said, cut forms are ideal, but you might find it difficult or not everyone will be happy to sign you a cut form, especially in certain areas like cardiothoracics. Don't worry. A simple letter or a testimonial from the module lead saying that this person has got the skills and knowledge up to a higher trainee is more than enough. Again, don't rush to sign the paper and assessment. Let people in your department get to know you. Show flexibility and resilience. 30% of the Caesar, right, is about your personal character. If the people in your department likes you, likes your personality, if you showed enough flexibility and resilience, that will make your life much, much more easier, right? All people will be willing to help support to give referencing and to give nice comments on the workplace based assessments and perhaps or not perhaps most likely they will be more keen to have you as a future consultant right just adding to this few more points which i've, I've picked up from uh, dr um, uh, walid's talk about the authentication right for in terms of authentication because i've been in this problem with the, with the gmc if it, is, has, if it has been stamped by the rewarding body, for example, I, I, I brought some evidence from uh, my university from Egypt and it has been stamped and this stamp has been translated by an approved translation office. That is an authentication. You don't need to, to send this um, doc, piece of document to a solicitor because it is already authenticated from the rewarding body. So not each and every paper you have to authenticate with, uh, in a solicitor. I spoke to my advisor and I've explained that to her and, and she accepted it. Uh, the other thing about, yes, uh, we, we, we talked about if you are getting a retrograde evidence from the overseas, please be transparent and honest and that automatically will tick off the um, triangulation um, of evidence. In, um, in terms of the CV, there is a GMC guidance on how to write a CV for a Caesar application. If you follow this guidance, follow, follow the, the titles and subtitles and just reform your CV according to this guidance and that's it. Yeah, I highlighted this point. Thank you. Uh, there, there was a very good question about having a local consultant or being a local consultant. If you are at the very early beginning of Caesar. I wouldn't recommend starting a local consultant and I would do recommend for you to step down as a senior fellow or even a trust grade doctor in a hospital who is willing to um, help you. And you can say this clearly in the interview when you're doing the interview for a trust grade or a senior fellow that you are doing a Caesar, you will need to rotate um, across various specialties to be able to sign off the higher module. If they accept that, that's fine. If not, then if they say, 
clearly, no, we are not, we are not going to support you in that uh, application, which is unlikely to happen, to be honest. Everybody will be happy to help. Uh, but just in case that you, you didn't feel that they are uh, willing to help you in this um, uh, area and they only want you for service provision, then go and find another job. So if you are planning to submit 14 modules, it will be virtually impossible to do it while you are a local consultant because you have service duty. You work at least three or four days a week. You will only have one day a week as an SPA or uh, as an admin one day a week, then you you, you need a, um, at least maybe twelve or twenty weeks to sign off any module, and that will be that will make that will make the process very very long. I moved to a local consultant post when I was in a position of having three or four modules left, so I signed off the perioperative, the pediatric, the airway, and uh, max fax modules while I was a local consultant. And those are four modules while I was a local consultant. I was doing like one or two days a week. Okay, so to uh, cut it short, it is area. doable, but not this for not all the problem. modules. Yeah. Doable, but it depends on where are you in the Caesar process. If, Perfect. if you are approaching the end, then yes, you can do that. If not, if you are in a very early beginning, so please don't. And that's all about it. I hope that helps. Perfect. So let's go to a few questions. Here. Maybe Thank a few you, of them Rida. are repeated. Uh, so how much total duration uh, yes. Dr. Rom, uh, expected to finish the whole Yeah, process? this is a very good question. If you know if you know what you need to do, and if, if it is clear in your mind, and you have the good mindset and the structure, and if you already started collecting the forms and your institution or hospital is aware what you are doing and what you are after, it shouldn't take you more than 18 or 24 weeks. Uh, sorry, 24 months, so two years. Okay, and from submission uh, of your documents to... But as I said, always, always expect some delays. Yeah. And, and always, what... always expect some delays because there is, the... there is a service provision duty. They may, they may not be able to rotate you to a cardiothoracic module at the time being. They, will, they may ask you to defer this plan till the next rotation. So there may be some delays, especially okay. in the current COVID crisis. And from the time of submission until you get it, if you get it from the first time, are we talking about five to six months, roughly? Yeah, th theoretically, yes. But I was in a different position because I I've submitted in um, September 19, right? And then the COVID came in March. So that caused um, mm. a significant um, amount of time for delay, right? So it took me a around a year from... So well, I submitted on the 6th of September, 2019, and I got the results on the 3rd of September, 2020. But okay. uh, don't take me as a guide because there has been two lockdowns, right, um, throughout this year. So theoretically, it shouldn't take more than six months, three months for the GMC and three months for the Royal College. And if you are very well organized and you're submitting an evidence in a good way, it can take down to four months. Two months with the Royal College, sorry, two months with the GMC and two months with the Royal College. Good. And you answered this question. You submitted a lot of evidence from your home country. So still, this is an answer to a lot of questions, but make it. Yes, I have. I have. But most of my evidence are more than five years old. But I, I, I have, um, I still, um, I did submit it. As I said, you don't have to submit loads of paperwork. It's all about information about your hospital. A uh, report of your clinic rotations that you, you, you did and, uh, and a certificate of experience. And if there is any periodic assessment you did during this assessment, and as I said, this can be written retrograde, but with honesty and transparency. Correct. And you can easily you can easily assign one of you one, one of the consultants who is working in your home country as a verifier. And uh, have you been very strict with the number of DOPs or CDPs or there is one stage that you said that's enough? Uh, and, and I think yeah. completion of your training To be honest, I have been enough. very, very, very generous with numbers, right? Okay. So, for example, if it says on the guidance or in the regional school of anesthesia in a certain area that you need to submit four uh, workplace-based assessments, I would submit six or eight. So you recommend to right. be, so be, more be generous. generous. Yeah. yeah, be more generous with the workplace assessments. 
if you think, uh, uh, about just one advice for the fresh applicants, what is the peer of this lecture? The first thing, ask yourself, are you a candidate for Caesar or not? So go to the first slide I, I have uh, uh, presented. If you have seven years of structured training overseas, no matter when, and if you have an exit exam or are you willing to sit the FRCA, then yes, you are a good candidate. Get to know what you need to do. Find the, 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 the right job for you and be open in the interview. Say that I want to, to have sort of a rotational fellowship through various subspecialties to be able to sign off the higher modules of training. Fact. If you are willing to do, uh, um, it, it's becoming more easy because most of the hospitals now are aware of the Caesar process and a good number of them has already designed a Caesar fellow like Southampton, Sheffield, they've already designed Caesar fellow, right? So they are becoming more aware of the process. Okay, if the clock goes backwards, what would you do differently? If you think about anything. Well, um, um, it, it took me some time to get to know what I need to do, right? So for example, um, uh, I, I didn't have, um, I didn't go through, through a meeting which told me exactly where to start. For example, when I started with the ITU module, I, I printed out the, um, the Royal College curriculum, intermediate and higher. By the way, you don't need to sign an intermediate module, just go for the higher module. That was a okay? question, you actually. Don't, need an intermediate module. Don't, go, don't bother about the intermediate module. Your overseas training should fulfill that. Just sign off the higher module. Don't bother at all with the intermediate Perfect. module. Okay. <clears throat> um, so I went through the um, intermediate and the higher. Every single knowledge and skill. And I, uh, retrospectively, I found that I didn't need to go through all this, right? When I go, when I went to the uh, regional school of anesthesia. It just says four assessments in certain topics, right? So in my early beginning, I was, it was just like a trial and error. I wasn't sure what I need to do, what, um, what is not necessarily to, to have, right? So I spent some time trying to find what is the shortest way to, to get it done. Also, some of the modules when I started in the early beginning, I didn't speak to the module lead at the beginning right okay. and i've asked him retrospectively to sign off the cut form and this is not right because you will be always under pressure to submit as much evidence as you can to convince the module lead uh, to sign it off but actually if you if you speak to him before you start it will make it much more easier and this is what happened on the last four modules i've signed up while i was looking consultant right <clears throat> okay so did you uh uh, submit a research project to set like a randomized controlled trial, or this is not a mandatory thing. Yeah. And audits are enough. I, yeah, I, I think I've, I've answered this question. You don't have to have a big research project. You don't have to invent or to um, um, present a big research project. As I said, a simple audit um, could be more than enough. Um, if there is a research project going on in your hospital or in your department, if someone is um, um, publishing a study, it's it's very good chance for you to take part of it and to have your name on this paper, you know, on this piece of paper. But as I said, you don't you are not expecting to submit um, or, or 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 to achieve a big research project. If it is talking, there, that is very good. And if not, about don't anesthetics. worry about it. Sorry, for a we are talking here about yeah. anesthetics in particular because. I know that in cardiothoracic surgery, uh, it's mm. completely different category of fish. They will not accept. Yeah, yeah. as uh, I said, your, I'll be your, more focused on anesthetics. Yeah. yeah, so yeah. it's different I'll be more because we, on we have colleagues yeah. from different departments, so you need to uh, counter check yeah. that with your uh, CESA application process yeah. and the medical council, if this is a requirement or not. For example, cardiothoracic uh, surgery, they need to submit a randomized controlled trial, even prospective mm. is a bit doubtful. So go back to the guidelines. Yeah, of course, as you said, as you said, Dr. Reed, before, everybody should read the specialty specific guidance, the SSG, Correct. for his specialty before he starts, and he should digest all the information written in it quite well. Okay. 
So did you apply for a regular or electronic portfolio, Dr. Rohan? I started with the regular, but then the electronic portfolio um, uh, came in, in place. But still, if you have an LLP and you have all your assessments on your e-portfolio or the LLP portfolio, you still need to download it as a PDF and resubmit it separately on the GMC. I've had a chat and some uh, discussion with the GMC with regards to that. What is the point of having to download all the documents right. and resubmit them as a separate evidence on the GMC website? Yeah. But I couldn't, I couldn't convince them, um, unfortunately. I hear you. The, because the Royal College can simply access your portfolio and see all the evidence. And that would make it much more easier, but they are very strict to that. I believe they are still want to make some difference between a national trainee and the Caesar applicants, okay. right? That makes sense. There, okay. there has to be some sense. sort of difference between both. So they are still strict in you having to download all the evidence and re-upload it on the GMC website. Good. Uh, so thanks very much, uh, Dr. Durham, and I'm really thankful to Marjit uh, Batil. Uh, he's helping us in the chat a lot. Uh, we'll go through uh, the questions here in the chat if we missed anything. Um, the first question was about the locum, and you answered that one, the locum consultant. Um, good. And you answered about, do we need to do the intermediate before the hire? And we said, no, you don't need to. No. Uh, uh, how many cut forms required? And you said 14 cut forms, variable in different specialties. I think we need to highlight this point in particular, Mohammed. So the 14 yes, cut forms in, in is anesthetics. covering... Mm. Okay, go ahead. In, in anesthetics, there are four big modules. Neuroanesthesia, cardiac anesthesia, pediatric and ICU. Those are the four major modules. And for the general, there are four mandatory modules, airway, ENT, max, fax, and head and neck. It's all one module. However, there is a very good uh, tip here. The, mo in most hospitals, the airway and the max, fax modules have only one module lead. So it is like a combined module. You can make them together. So after a few weeks, you can have two cut forms. So the same module lead will sign you off the two modules, the airway and the max fax. And it is the same for the trauma and orthopedic. There will be one module for both, mod one module lead for both modules. Good. So by working in this module, you can have two cut forms signed by the same module lead, right? So airway, the mandatory general uh, modules are the airway, ANT max fax, and number, um, number three is resuscitation, perioperative medicine, intermediate obstetrics, intermediate pain management, and you should have an advanced module as a subspecialty. So that's total of seven on top of the four mandatory modules that will make a total of 11. The rest, the, 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 the three modules left is, is of your choice. You can choose any of the general, trauma and orthopedic, sedation, day case, regional and vascular. You can choose whatever you want. So you can choose three modules on top of the 11 required modules. Okay. Uh, one question comes uh, here uh, to Muhammad. If I have a lead, just one lead for three, four different modules, for example, he is doing orthopedics and trauma and neurosurgery. Is that something of, mm. like, of a concern from the medical council or the college, do you think? No, it's not. No, no, it's not a con so, it's not of concern at all. Not of concern at all, but it's unlikely to have a neurosurgery or to have a, a mod, um, one module lead for three or four modules. I, I've never heard about that. It's very unlikely to happen. But if it happens, it shouldn't be a problem. Uh, yes, it, it, in, in Ireland, it's a bit different. So when I'm asking for mm -hmm. someone to sign off my modules, uh, yeah. for the big modules like the neuroanesthesia or the neuroanesthesia, yes, you're right, and cardiothoracic, but I may find because uh, the, 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 the answer simply... Mm -hmm. A simple answer to that, a cut form is based on various uh, assessments, right? Mm -hmm. And these those assessments will come from different consultants, That's the point. right? Yes. So it is it is based on assessments from various consultants in this specific area. Okay. Uh, any multi-source feedback uh, while working overseas? The multi-source feedback is standard feedback form. It's available on the uh, Royal College yeah. website. You can download it and use it. 
wherever you wish, but just remove the Royal College of Anesthesia title from there uh, and modify it as per your, what you're doing. Um, okay. Uh, Mohideen is asking if I did an assistant lecturer uh, back home in Egypt, and I think this question you have a right answer uh, to uh, Muhammad yourself mm. because you've been working in that. Uh, yeah. You've you, been in, her, in his shoes before. Uh, will that count yeah. in the term of teaching and uh, the academic? Yes. Good. Yes, of course. You you should combine your three years residency and four years assistant lecturer as a training program. So we have a total of seven years of training program. And whatever teaching you have done uh, in this period, if you can get any, ev any sort of evidence to this teaching activity, that should be perfect. Also, it includes um, supervising juniors. It, 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 it will involve uh, working in a team. Working in a university hospital overseas should tick off various boxes in terms of teamwork, work, um, supervising juniors, and teaching activity. Uh, perfect. Okay, so last question here in the chat box. Okay, if you get uh, a feedback from colleague, should that be anonymous? So we know that the patient um, names and, and all the details of the patients should be anonymized, but a feedback yes, I from think so. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I, 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 I am with this question on the same page. I don't know the right answer. Mm -hmm. it, it is mentioned mm -hmm. that it should be anonymized somewhere in the uh, advice. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think it, it, must be, uh, it must be anonymized, right? Even from police. Um, yeah. It must be anonymized. I think if, if that feedback involves you and others, so um, delete the names of the others, but just try to show who is sending this feedback, whether he's a consultant or whether he's a senior um, fellow colleague or whether he is uh, one of the management team. Just try, just try to make it clear who is sending this feedback. Yeah, uh, Amar, Amar Jit uh, Patil is in disagreement with this answer. He said, from colleagues and mm. consultants, no need for anonymization. It is only mm. anonymous if a trainee or a patient. Do you agree? He could be right. Well, I'm, I'm, not, sure. I'm not sure about it. Okay, I'm not sure about so we'll counter check that uh, with uh, the medical counts. Just like mm. always uh, questions, you are in doubt about the answer. We don't want to miss I can remember I had, I had a thank you letter uh, as an email and I have anonymized the other colleagues mentioned in this email, but um, I can't remember whether I anonymized the one who sent that feedback or not, the consultant who sent that feedback or not. Uh, I'm really thankful for uh, everyone attended here. Uh, my full appreciation, uh, uh, Dr. Durgham, for your presence and your time today. It's a weekend, so thank you very much for being with us. Thanks for help, uh, Dr. Patil, uh, uh, with your support, with answering the questions. Uh, kindly contact me, Dr. Patil. We need to uh, sort something out in a more organized fashion in the coming session. So I would be very happy if you can help me in that regards. Uh, and I would say see you next uh, Sunday, uh, inshallah. And next Sunday, our guest will be Dr. Ahmed Kafafi. And he did a pain, uh, non-CCT Caesar. So it will be a bit change uh, of the regular or the straightforward applications uh, because you depend on the CCT. So it's a non-CCT Caesar kind of a change. And we'll keep you updated and uh, informed on the Telegram group. And thanks so much. Uh, hopefully, we answered all the questions. It's a question in the chat. Uh, it was very informative. Thanks very much. Thanks a million. Thank and you, Dr. Malid, and all the best for all. Thanks so much, Dr. Mohammed, for your time.